Hello, this is Tony Way. You're listening to the Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Okay. Tony Way is a brilliant actor whose filmography includes Edge of Tomorrow, Game of Thrones, and currently the best show on streaming, Afterlife, currently playing on Netflix. Tony Way, welcome to the podcast. Hello, how are you doing? So I'd, I'd like you to know that I had your stepson, Ethan, on the podcast last night. We had a long discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and we the hot topics of discussion were uh, pineapple on pizza, whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. But okay. um, all kidding aside, um, really a, a good, solid human being and, and a great actor. He's lovely. Ethan is the best. Yeah. And I bet he's pro pineapple, right? <laughs> he is very pro pineapple. Mm, yeah, but I, I but, knew but, it. <laughs> but I got to tell you, Tony, I, I found that out after I said, I said, people who put p- uh, pineapple on pizza should be locked up. And then he proceeded to tell me that <laughs> it was his, he loved it. So I felt like a bit of an ass, but it, uh, he worked, he worked in a pizza place. Uh, so I think if you work somewhere like that, you end up trying everything on the pizza. Yeah. So yeah. I imagine he's, he's sort of, you know, it's like Stockholm syndrome. of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> He he does he does have the cred. I can't I can't argue it. But I just I, I got to tell you, if it was the last food on earth, I couldn't mix them together. I don't I I, I don't know. I don't get it. Well, what's your just getting out of nowhere? What, what's your ideal pizza? Everyone has their uh, ideal. Uh, you know, I I quite like anchovies. That's another controversial area. But I think a straight pepperoni pizza. Yeah, I'm very happy with that. A, a meat a meaty pizza for me. Right. Um. If you if you don't like pineapple on pizza, you'd be blown away by something we have in the UK. It's quite old and kitsch now, but growing up at a party, you'd have cocktail sticks yeah. with chunks of cheap cheddar and pineapple chunks stick stuck in a sort of grapefruit. <laughs> that was that was a party food of, of my youth. <laughs> I, I I don't think I, I don't think I could do that. I, I don't think I could do that. Um, but um, you know what I wanted to ask you is uh, all all great people are clearly born in October, right? We, we get we can agree on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so i have to say you know um I, i'm truly taken back by your filmography like i knew i know a lot of your work but when i really like did the deep dive my god tony i was like blown away by what was there i mean not that i was expecting any different i, I mean i knew the really the heavy hitter stuff but there's a lot of the uk stuff i was maybe a, not a lot a little bit of the uk stuff i was unfamiliar with but you mm. have a very your filmography is very lengthy it's solid it's not like these you know, things I've never heard of. They're just amazing projects. Um, is that how you view it? Like, you know, you're just this, or do you just keep rolling along? Because my gosh, it's just a very impressive filmography. I mean, I, I like all actors, I've been a jobbing actor a lot longer than I've been a successful actor, if you know what I mean. Right. So I, I, I don't think I've ever stopped having that mindset. It's all about, right, what's next? What should I do? And And I think I've been, you know, I've been quite lucky in the projects I've got. Because lots of them could have been awful, you right. know. It wasn't like I've always been a bit in a position through my career where I could knock stuff back. You know, you have to earn, you have to work, right. and you want right. to work, right? And I just think I've been quite lucky that the the right things have come up, and I, I've sort of impressed the right people to be in these things. Um, a lot of people are surprised, and they, are, and they see me in these things. Sometimes it's a sort of they get quite they're sort of oh he's in everything. How does he do it? And that. I don't know, really. I, I sort of, I guess I'm, I'm okay at acting. Um, I don't get it's a bit of an, under, bit of an, bit of an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, yeah. But you know, it's someone told me the other day how many um, credits I had, and I was slightly surprised. I hadn't. I don't really think of it in that way. I don't count them up. Um, someone had looked at my IMDb, and it, and I went, "Oh, that is a lot." And I, I mean, I've either. I'm either the best actor in the world or I'm not very fussy. I couldn't tell you which one <laughs> you can <laughs> <No>. judge. <laughs> the, the strength of your filmography is amazing. And, and my, my next question has been stolen by the poster in back of you. Tell people what stay stay alive, Peppy, is because it's a huge it's yeah. a huge it's it's a huge part of the foundation of your life, it's, right? It's it's like I am if it wasn't for that, uh, Stay Alive Peppy is a sketch group I was in, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be doing any of this. It wasn't even on my horizon. I, I I liked a bit of acting and drama and showing off at school, but the idea that this could be a job was far from my mind. I, I wasn't a drama school kid, or uh, it wasn't a big dream of mine. 
Um, but me and a few friends at, at school, um, when we were sort of 17, 18, used to sort of waste time with camcorders. This is long before YouTube, making videos, funny videos for our friends. Yeah. And we called ourselves Stay Alive Peppy. The name I was the, the reason for the name has long been lost in the mists of time. I cannot <laughs> for the life of me remember why we were called Stay Alive Peppy. Yeah. But it was just for fun. It was absolutely for us, our friends. And and we used to use the media studies uh thing at, at where we were doing our A levels uh to, to sort of cut them, but really crudely, like we barely edited them. Then out of the blue, one day, Reese, who was the sort of one of the founder members of, of there were five of us originally, right? Um, called to get tickets for a show called Shooting Stars, which was huge in the UK at the time. Uh, a sort of panel show, but that doesn't do it any justice. It was it was Vic and Bob, uh, Reeves and Mortimer wrote it, wrote everything. They're they're geniuses. Right. He called that production company to see if he could get us all tickets because we were fans. Um, and they said, that's not how you get tickets. You call a, a ticket company. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but you've just phoned like the producers. And Reese being Reese, like uh, always sort of looking to get ahead. And uh, I don't know if he had an idea, idea of being in the business, but just as they were about to hang up, said, oh, have you got any work experience there? I'm allowed to go and work somewhere for a couple of weeks as part of my A-levels. And she went quiet for a bit and said, I'll just check. Yeah, actually, we need a runner. Would you like to come in? Um, and then a long story, very long story short, he became good friends with Bob of, of Vic and Bob, who was who was the lead and the writer, and Charlie Higson from The Far Show, amazing writer. Yeah. Before, we, we didn't even know this, he'd handed, he'd palmed them our videos that we were just doing for fun. Before you knew it, we, we were on tv <laughs> it was wow. sort of crazy they they took there there are there are a bunch of guys who all were given a chance and they really like to pass that on they're always giving new people a chance but i don't think they'd have found anyone newer than us we were literally still at school um, wow that's that's when i got the bug you know yeah and, and is at the time for you it was just with your friends having fun they're, these guys that just love you know making each other laugh or making videos Little did you know how, I mean, did you know that they were quality enough where somebody could actually put them at, at the next level? Did you realize that when you're making it? Or do you see it as, you know, just a bunch of friends just, just doing their thing, right? I mean, you, there's no one cockier than a 17-year-old, a group of 17-year-old <laughs> boys. So we kind of, once some people had seen them and thought they were funny, we did knock around the term comedy genius amongst ourselves much to my shame now you know that <laughs> that cockiness gets kicked out of you very quickly yes. especially in the comedy business but we didn't I, I had no idea I did as I say I didn't even know it was a job really I, I kind of loved comedy on tv but I didn't see it as a thing that you could do um even when we first I first the first ever job I had was on the fast show which was the biggest comedy on British TV at the time. It was all catchphrases. It's brilliant. It's much loved. And I got a chance to be an e extra in a couple of sketches. It was like a day out. We all got taken along. Right. Um, Reese, we were going to be in a, like a Britpop band because we were the youngest people they'd met. <laughs> so we right. looked like we could have been in a not good band. <laughs> and then we did some other little bits. And then a week later, I thought that was a fun day out. That was that still no nowhere in my mind was I thinking this is a job. Right. And I got a call back saying, you did well from one of the producers. Um, would you like to come in next week for a four weeks rehearsal? We're going to do a proper sketch. You'll be in, you'll be a man in a sketch, proper lines, everything. Um, and it was a suits you, sir, sketch, which I, to, a, to an American, I don't know if that means anything, but it was like the biggest catchphrase. It was a big thing. Right. In the 90s. And um, I went out in an audience. And, and didn't mess it up did it in one take and then everyone laughed everyone applauded um i obviously assumed it was all for me not right. for <laughs> the stuff of the show. but i genuinely remember being there looking around at the light and the people thinking right this is my job now this is what i am doing right um right i can't think of anything else i'd ever want to do you know <laughs> yeah yeah and, and you know I, I hear you talk about you know obviously yeah the, the cocky 17 year old i totally get that you know but <laughs> But you as a person, like, so just to kind of go into this backstory, you know, I feel like when I go, I, I ask people on the podcast that have moved me, their work has moved me. I feel like it makes for a, an authentic interview. 
you know, and when you reach out to some people, it's like, you know, you're not Kimmel, you know, who you're not Graham Norton. Who are you? Like, it's like, they look at you. I almost think like some people forget where they started and what it's like to have somebody like, like give them that opportunity. But I feel like you are such a humble man in that way, where you're very giving, you're very much a pay it forward person. And to somebody like me, who's been doing this for seven years, but to still have someone like you, like just agree to come on and, and, and tell these wonderful stories. I don't know, I just feel like it's it's more than just you agreeing to a podcast. I feel like that's kind of who you are as a human being, Tony. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, there's a thing that uh, I certainly didn't coin this phrase, and I think I, I, I'll say it was Paul Whitehouse from The Far Show who I first heard say it, that most com comedy people fall into comedy. So if you're coming at this job from the comedy perspective, I think of myself more as an actor now, but... I was definitely, it was a car as a comedian to start with, a, a comedy writer and performer. We fall into it. So we're normally quite normal. We, right. We're normal guys. You know, uh, Paul and Charlie were plasterers, you know, on building sites when they started doing comedy writing. You know, ev every other person who's in comedy normally comes from a sort of quite humble background. Not everyone, you know, there's there's a lot of posh comedy in this. Yes. Country, and it's, that's great too. It's great. Right. But th there's a... There's a sort of reality. There has to be a reality to the sort of stuff I do, the comedy I do. That I think that's part of it. I'm, I'm, I'm myself as much as possible at all times, and hopefully that's a good thing and and, and not a bad thing. Um, but I, why wouldn't I mean? I, it's no. There's well, the way I always see it is there's no skin off my nose helping someone, um, yeah. and there's certainly no skin off my nose chatting to someone if I've got the time and and I'm available. And I like talking, so <laughs> no, you, yeah. they don't mind listening. <laughs> yeah, and I've watched you in other interviews. You exude kindness, but like it's it's amazing. I mean, I, I guess in a way, podcasting is similar to acting that way. But you know, it's it's like mm. some people you you reach out and you're very kind to them, and it's almost like yeah, not everybody. It's like less than ten percent, but it's like how dare you? It's just it's just amazing because I feel like people always kind of forget their roots. I don't get that feeling from you, and that's just such a welcoming thing. Um, so I asked um Ethan this yesterday. Have you been to the states, Tony? Yes, I have. Um, not for a huge amount of time. I, I did I did it this I suppose it's the right way. I went to LA and I had a gig. So gotcha. I had a job to do. I didn't go okay. there to to sort of make it or, or chase work. Um I did the Girl with a Dragon Tattoo there. Um a Great couple movie. of scenes there. So that mm -hmm. I got a really my I don't know if I want to go back to America and spoil. It was like first class flights roosevelt hotel yeah i was there for three weeks it was yeah. amazing and i was supposed to have all kinds of american meetings with managers and casting people but it's david fincher production so you're waiting yeah. ready and waiting to be used so yeah i didn't want to i didn't you know want to not be ready to be on set if you know what i mean yes so I got, it, it didn't happen that way but i'm very london based um yes but I'd love to go back to America, but I'd like to be paid to go or be go there on holiday. If you know, right. What I mean. Yes. Yes. And, and the reason I asked that is because, um, you know, cause I think Ethan is from Essex as well. I'm yeah. trying to think what you could compare Essex to in the States. So I could get like, oh, very he, simple. He, he, very he said, simple. He, he said white collar. He said Arkansas, but filled with like white collar. <laughs> no, he's way off. <laughs> he's little, I know, I know Ethan's little village. It's quite conservative. It's quite, most of Essex, it's New Jersey, yeah. from what I can gather. Gotcha. Housewives of New Jersey, New Jersey as well. It's that kind of... Gotcha. There's a show called The Only Way is Essex. If you watch that, you'll go, oh, right, this is the real Housewives territory. It's that. <laughs> that's the bit I know. And yeah. that's, It wasn't quite like that when I, when I was young, living there, because obviously everyone moves to London. Uh, if it's like moving to LA or New York for actors and, and creatives. You move to London. But um, yeah, I'd say New Jersey, definitely. Yeah, yeah there's a lot, a lot of people, a lot of working class guys that have made good, who used to live in the poorer parts of London in the in the old days. They moved to Essex, and then they're gotcha. they, with loads of money, lots of people in build in like building game, and and then their kids grow up and they're spoiled and rich. But yeah, it's, <laughs> that's not bless. I'm not knocking it though. It's, it did me fine. I was okay growing up in Essex. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned um, a girl with a dragon tattoo. Is it is it David Lynch that has that David Lynch has recommend that that has the reputation for doing 
many takes. Is that is that am I thinking of the right person? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but super enthusiastic. Like I turned up on set and I was big. You know, I'm I'm quite chunky now, but I put on a lot of weight for it. I thought I'd. That's not a hard thing. I like hot dogs and I like chicken, so it was okay. <laughs> Me too. Me too. But yeah, so I I was big and you know, and I turned up and I went for it because it's David Fincher. You know, it's, yeah. it's a big deal. Um, and I had a smallish part. It would have been if they'd made the trilogy. It would have been a bigger part. It would have gone on, but it was a nice part. Um, and I arrived and watched some of the shooting, and I did a little bit. Like I think I was doing some reverses, so I wasn't I didn't have any lines in that bit. And he came over and said, "Tony, come with me." And I was like, "Ah, oh, crap! All right, this is I'm being fired. This is like <laughs> I knew this was like they've flown me. This has cost them tens of thousands of dollars. Like what? I, this I'm not right. I'm not the guy he wanted." Yeah. And he said, "He said, come with me to my trailer." So I followed him to his trailer. He's got a big trailer. Wandered in, I thought this is taking me into private. So yeah, I think I'm getting <laughs> canned. <here." laughs> and he went and he turned to me and said, This is what we're doing. This is what it's all about. And he had his uh he had a whole editing suite set up in this trailer. And he clicked play and literally just met him. He played me this cut of a trailer for Go of the Dragon 2. It's an amazing trailer. I think it I think it won awards for trailers. It's so it's a good. great, it, great trailer. It's got Led yeah. Zeppelin and it's it's amazing. He played me that basically yeah. as it because they'd shot loads of stuff in sweden already and said that's what we're doing it for so you know thanks for thanks for looking tony let's go and go back and do it yeah so to take the time out to show me that and yeah and i was then excited and hyped and so but it did mean when i was closing the door and saying no thank you for the 50th ty- time in <laughs> in one shot yeah i still felt pumped <laughs> because I, yeah you know, david had but it, yeah I, I i think i heard that he had um rooney doing there's a long long there's a lot of scenes of her researching in a library I don't know if you remember that stuff yes great movie. yeah of course yeah. And, and i think it was a week of her moving pieces of paper move it this way <sighs> move it that way look at that photo put it back look at it think about it like just on and on and on but He's. I don't think he's made a bad movie. So no, he's a phenomenal phenom- process. Yeah, you know, it, but I would love to work out. I'd love to. I'd, I wish I could work out which take of me saying no, thank you, or no, thank you, or no, thank you. <laughs> he used because I bet you it was like take one or two. And yeah, not yeah, take thirty. <laughs> yeah, and you're not. And I mutilated his name, you know. But when it comes to Fincher, you know, I had a guest on from Mindhunter on that was on Netflix, which is great crime mm, show. And he said yeah. he, you know, there was a there was a 75 take scene. I'm like, there's no way he's this guy's exaggerating. And, and he's not. He wasn't like he really does do like many, yeah. many, many. And, and like you said, who who am I to argue with genius? Like who's anybody? Yeah, like yeah. He's, the man makes quality stuff. You can't argue with it. So absolutely, uh, it's, it, it's it's tricky when it comes to the UK though. It's that sort of thing. We still have tea breaks. Right, and <laughs> things like that. We all yeah. go home. It's like yeah. it's a different filming kind of. Uh, but he films in the UK a lot, so it must. Perhaps it's his way of going. Right, okay, maybe I've gone on too long. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, um, just diving into your filmography, a few entries here. Um, I, you know, I really loved you in um, <laughs> in the house, and you know, uh, the Ali G show was something that I picked up on late when it came out. It was two thousand three or four for me in the states, mm. but it was playing in the UK long before that. I was it, I was there right at the beginning with that as well. There was a show called the Eleven O'clock Show, uh, yeah. which was like a, a nightly topical satire show that I was a writer on, and that's where he started that character actually. Once a week, it was so popular wow. that character that um, it was so popular that it went out three nights a week with Eleven O'clock Show, and his character got so popular so quick they wouldn't put he oh. him on until the last day of the week to make sure. People tuned in all week just in case there was going to be some Ali G in the show. Wow. It was a little trick they did because the show, other than that, it wasn't doing so well. <laughs> it was doing fine, but yeah, people were tuning in for, for Sasha. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And he is, um, you know, I look at that show, you know, I mean, because we're getting into the movie, but like he does, you know, obviously for those listening, he does three primary characters, Bruno Bora and Ali G. But, you know, just watching it today, knowing you were in it, the movie and the show, I mean, it's absolute. Like I remember watching it for the first time uh tony i was 
blown. I don't think I've laughed so hard in my life. Like the stuff where he brings people. Like he was doing something today. Uh, well, I was watching that. I've seen it before. I I have the DVDs. But he was he was talking about bullying with this panel, like bullying, right? And by the end of the interview, he's bullying. A, like the way that turned, it was just yeah, yeah. It's it's pure it's, it's genius. Very clever. It's a weird one, the Ali G movie because the Ali G in the house because it's between his UK shows and him going to America to do the US shows. Yeah. He did <clears throat> the movie and it's an odd one because it's real. It's not real rather. It's, it's a, it's a pretty standard British comedy movie. Right. So there's a, it's an oddness there that he's, he's gone from doing stuff with, you know, real people uh, undercover. Suddenly there's this scripted movie quite right. standard. Right. <clears throat> and then he goes back to the, I think he went back to the US and went, no, no, I, I know what, I'm doing uh, and I'm going to go back to doing that. Yeah. The yeah. Pe the people he gets, the people he gets are extraordinary in the U S as well. It's amazing to, to me that he, he got some extraordinary people. He did, but, 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 he, as well. but even in the house, like Mark, you're in it. Martin Freeman is in it. I mean, that is a pretty, like, I, I totally forgot the two of you were in that movie and, you know, talk about two wonderful actors. Like it's, it's like a, <clears throat> it's a sneaky, good, underrated movie. A very good, a good time kind of movie. You know, it's a great cut. And also, you've got Charles Dance in there, and people like oh. that you forget. Yes, but like I remember, I remember Martin on that had just done The Office, and it hadn't been out yet. And he was, you know, actors don't really ever say the stuff they're in's good, especially British actors. We, right. we, you know, it's always. Yeah, it was fine. It didn't, you know, the food was rubbish. We'll say things yeah. like, that, like the catering was bad. <laughs> but he 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 said, no, this this is good. This is a different. This is there's something about the office. And he was right. It was by the time he came back to the reshoots, it was like a phenomena. The office. It was huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he was yeah. he was doing Gervais and Sasha Baron Cohen in the same year. Um, was wow. young Martin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and do you find that you know when you when you're working work with with a Sasha Baron Cohen because you know um I, I think he's a genius do you pick do you learn along the way because we talked about your your wonderful filmography do you feel like you pick up things on each project especially with a, I, I think he's an absolute genius um yes yeah I mean I also I was very young as well so everything I did um for those first five even now even up to now but the first five years especially I didn't really know what I was doing I, I didn't really know like learning how a film set works and a TV studio works and what actors do between filming and, and learning lines and, you know, all of that stuff. I learned on the job pretty much. And I had some really good teachers along the way. Martin definitely, Martin Freeman was one of those. Sasha was busy. He was producing <laughs> and yeah. writing and yeah. that sort of thing. But yeah. um, he definitely sh showed me the, the way that someone, an auteur could work, someone who's got a single vision about what they're going to do and, and, and sort of sticking to it, you know, it, it, it's, it, he never sort of sways. He does what he wants to do and, and, and see and for good or bad, he sees it through. There's a few people. I remember spending a lot of time with an actor called Alex Lowe, yeah. who was in uh, a sitcom that my friend Reese wrote, uh, fun at the funeral parlor and learning a lot from him. He's a proper actor, you know, he's right. an actor and he's lovely. And he's a good, he's a good friend. And, I learned a lot from him mm. about acting and just how to be an actor, if you know what I mean. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just how to sort of, you know, you don't, I didn't have to learn to be how to be nice, but it's learning how to sort of, you know, be an adult <laughs> a little Absolutely. bit as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention Game of Thrones for those that are huge Game of Thrones fans. Uh, uh, Dantos the Red, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful character again. And, he 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 like me enjoys several libations. Um, you know, <laughs> there's that's okay. Uh, but you're, you're I mean, you talk about and, and I was reading comments. It, there was so so many scenes. He's such a beloved character. It's amazing. Mm. But but he's a nice guy. He's a good guy. He has uh, ethics, which in the Game of Thrones universe means he has a death sentence. So he's eliminated, <laughs> right? So uh, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sure you've been asked a zillion times, but just a wonderful wonderful character um you know and i don't want to say forgotten because there's so many characters but underrated but still like i feel like people don't forget him like he's very loved like whether you're in the states watching it or uk you have this appreciation for this kind man like this just just good man 
it's 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 you know I, that's what I get from people who are fans. You know, Game of Thrones fans are, are all lovely. They're they're such they're some of the best fans. That's not to say Afterlife fans aren't too, but Game <laughs> yeah. of Thrones fans, you know, they come at the way they come at you is always so genuine, and they love that show. You know, um, and I think because he's, you know, he's he's got his dark side as well, Dantas, because you know he's involved in some shady stuff. There. A little bit, yeah. But you can, bit. I think you can probably blame the drink. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's I loved playing that character. I really, really did, and I. When I did series season two, I came in and it wasn't huge. Game of Thrones was big, but it wasn't what it become. Right. And I had such a great time. And I thought that was that. I genuinely did. And then to get called back for season four, because I thought, well, you know, they can't do every storyline. That maybe will peter out. You know, that maybe, well, they, maybe they'll give that bit of storyline to someone else. It's been a while. And then to get called back to sort of see that through and then be so involved in such a monumental change in the show with the killing of Joffrey and all of that stuff, you know, yeah, was, huge episodes, huge. Yeah. yeah. And it was, I think it was genuinely, they said it was the most expensive TV scene filmed uh, at, to that point. I'm sure they broke the record later because they classed it as one scene. The whole wedding is classed as one scene. It's just part A, part B, part C. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. It was amazing. It was days and days of filming that. And, you know, I loved doing that show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, you, it's funny that you mentioned that, you know, the, the passion of Game of Thrones fans. It's very much like Star Wars fans, right? So the passion is really great, but there's times where the, the fans think they know where the story should go more than the writers. So yeah. it gets it gets a little murky, but you are, your sentiment is very correct. They are very mm-hmm. passionate. You know what they're thinking. They're not they're not going to hide or BS you, right? They're very... Forward, Absolutely. Right? And, and uh, you know what? The best thing you can do to be remembered is have a good death. Or a good scene had so that makes you stick in people's minds with Game of Thrones as well. A good exit, um, and a and a, and a really good torture scene <laughs> that always keeps you fresh, fresh in people's minds. <laughs> yeah, and you know you're, you're one of four castmates that's in Afterlife. Uh, David Bradley is an absolute legend. Paul K. I've had Tim Plester on the podcast. What a wonderful man he is. Yes, but like, but all of all the the, the people that are you and and, and the other three. But they all had these like legendary great parts. Like it's such a great thing to see, right? Like these, you know, the wedding or or Joffrey, you know, acting, you know, being poisoned. It's just these memorable, memorable moments. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Paul stuff in that is extraordinary. He got to do some proper cool stuff, Paul. Like us other guys, we got to, you know, do some good stuff. But Paul <laughs> went north of the wall and all that good stuff. Extraordinary. Um, I think also there's something to be said for you know, I, I'd always want to big up comedy actors. You know, we there's three of us there. Tim Tim comes from the comedy world, and Paul and myself all do. David's a very funny man as well. Yes, yeah. this, this, but he's you know he's a proper actor too, really. Yes, but you yes. Know, if you want if you want someone to do something memorable for you, you can always look to comedy to 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 find someone who doesn't mind you know looking awful. <laughs> Falling in a vat of wine or whatever, <laughs> you're up for it. We're doing yeah. it in Edinburgh anyway, every festival. So, yeah. And I have a great when we get to the afterlife, I have a great point about comedic actors and why they work so well. And it, right. it touches on that. Uh, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention um, uh, Jack Leeson, how fantastic he, he is as as Joffrey. I mean, and, and and reputation, you could justify this, I certainly can't, but reputation is one of the nicest human beings offset. But but on on scene, I don't think there was a there's been a bigger prick. I mean, maybe Ross from Friends, but I don't think there's been a bigger prick in, in, tele, in television history. You know, I don't, I, but I, I I you know that's he does it so like like here you are he's amazing. Like, oh God, like just one just a wonderful part. You know, uh, and, and you know what he's disgusting as that character, and he is the nicest guy you'll ever meet. I mean, genuinely so. And one of the smartest people you'll ever meet. He's so clever and humble, and he's quit. You know, he's gone off to do what he wants to do. It, that's the that's how nice he is. He doesn't even want to be an actor anymore. You know. Yeah, it just and, and that shows you how good an actor he is because he is. I mean, I, I guess he's been doing it for a very long time. He was a kid when he a very young kid when he started. So you, you, once you've seen a lot of stuff in film and TV, it does get a little bit samey. You know, it's the early starts and that sort of thing you want to go off and be young 
go and do yeah. a degree or whatever he's doing. <laughs> that that's a really good point. And um, do you realize when you're filming that, Tony, the magnitude of what you're doing at that moment? Do you realize, my God, like this is? I mean, I get it, Game of Thrones. It's not like it's a secret, but like, do you realize how legendary it is as you're as you're filming it? With Game of Thrones, not really. I knew it was. Po- I think it was cult popular when I did the f- season two. Right. And it wasn't until I came back for season four. It was like going back to a different world, different place. It was absolutely huge. Yeah. All the kids had grown up as well. That was weird seeing yeah, them all yeah, three years yeah. later. But it was a bit, it was very different. because we, I, Most of my stuff was filmed in Croatia, in Dubrovnik, which is that medieval city. And season two, they were just filming there. And it was more of a nuisance, I think, for the locals than anything. And series four when i came back we would be like when sophie and i because you can't drive in dubrovnik it's a that part of it, it's a walled city it's it's medieval no cars in and out right so you walk to set you walked to set and it was paparazzi and fans there were tours already happening like it was oh, the series wow. is still filming and they're doing like game of thrones tours like right nearby where you where you're actually filming the show which is mad yeah Wow! And I can only imagine that got bigger and bigger as the as it got more and more hyped as the se- seasons went on. So, um, yes, I know you sort of know and you hope it's going to be big and legendary. You don't dare to hope, really. And then, but you know, then you see it <laughs> happening. You go, yeah. Like, you after back- Afterlife is is a case in point. I I had no idea that what that was going to become. It's, it's so huge. It's mad. Yeah, I, I, you know, and, and you came back to a different beast when it came to Game of Thrones. Like, wh- from what you started with, to it's like from, like you mentioned, it's like, like you're almost on a different show at that point. Absolutely. You yeah. know? Um, it's, sudden, it's suddenly that, that whole thing of NDAs are being signed and cast are being scurried around so that people don't know. Because for some reason, everyone wants to know what's going to happen. You can, well, you don't really. <laughs> like, yeah, what's I don't... the show? <laughs> You're going to spoil it for yourself. <laughs> but, but, but I think, Tony, there's an unhealthy population out there that, that has a, a sick enjoyment with ruining it. For, so if I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm binge watching a show, I have to make it a point to stay off the internet, which sucks because there's things I like to do for the podcast and stuff. But it's like, I can't. I haven't seen an episode oh, of, yeah. you know. Man, I've, not, I've, I've not watched the last episode of Boba Fett yet. And it's been like half a day. I can't go on Twitter today. Yeah, me neither. You're right. And uh, I've not done today's Wordle. So (laughs) I don't go on Twitter (laughs) for that either. These are both going to get ruined. What's wrong with people? Yes. I mean, forget forget today's. I can't go near. Yeah, right. It dropped today. I haven't had a chance to see it. But yeah, Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Uh, The one thing before I get into Afterlife, um, I'm going to say this is the, I think you could call it sci-fi. Edge Edge of Tomorrow, would would you say it's sci-fi? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think yeah. so. Time travel. I mean, time travel and sci-fi. It's a bit of both, isn't it? It's yeah, it's a little bit. Near, what yeah. do you call it? near future, near future sci-fi. Yeah, but time travel doesn't have to be sci-fi, does it? I, I suppose I, you wouldn't call Groundhog Day sci-fi. No, so no, you would not. Yes, Groundhog right. Day meets Alien. I guess that, that's a bit. <laughs> that's that's my elevator pitch. That's what I should have called it. But you know, I feel like it, 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 in many ways it is so so immensely underrated like it gets great reviews people love it but i almost feel like it's got I, people that have seen it like really value it like it's just really really great i mean i've heard emily blunt on howard stern talking about how she sustained injuries that she still feels to this day from that movie mm. um, a lot of people sacrificed a lot for that movie and i feel like it's just one of the best of the last 10 15 20 years it's really really well done it's aged great it's a fun watch you can repeat watch it um Loved loved Kimmel on that, you know. Uh, <laughs> he's got the horrible end of Groundhog Day. If we're talking about making comparisons, boy, does he have it bad. But um, just any memories you wanted to share about that, because it's truly a wonderful, wonderful movie. I mean, it was it was it, it was an amazing opportunity, an amazing time. It was a slog, though, man. It was like winter. We did it all over the winter in the UK, six month shoot. Wow, all pretty much all outside. A lot of studios, well, but it was all back lot um out at the, at the warner brothers studios in leavesden in the north of london so it was cold you know it was snowing and wet and those suits right the, the suit that me and jonas armstrong wear they're 10 stone so what's that that's like 140 pound suit with, wow uh, it's full with the gun 
which I never even fire, by the way. <laughs> that movie. <laughs> never had that so chance. I, I don't know yeah. why I was carrying that. <laughs> but in uh, at its heaviest, we, Jonas and I were walking around with like you know a, a, a man, person, a, man. A, a person attached to you. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So that, it was tough. It was tough. We trained like, but there's this thing like Cruz. He makes you want to work for him. He's so enthusiastic and yes. so. He's really good, and he doesn't even have to do much. It's not like he's giving you pep talks and stuff. It's like it's just his enthusiasm makes you want to work hard. <laughs> it's weird. Like, yeah, I, but you I, see I, how hard he's working, right, Tony? So it's yeah. like you want yeah, to yeah. match that, yeah. Yeah, I asked him what what he does at the weekend. He said I work. That was his thing. I work because he had Mission Impossible to go on to. So he was like writing that at the time, uh, the next Mission Impossible at the time, and so he'd yeah. have at lunch breaks. He's cooking up ideas with Chris McQuarrie and. And then when you're not shooting, he's off doing, te- he was testing like the armor we were, where he was testing that stuff basically for us for months in advance. You know, he really, I think his fee, you know, his, his fee weighs on him. And I think he kind of knows that the whole success of the film weighs on him. So he, he tries his best to make it work. If you know what I mean, he's, you can tell that he's not the sort of, there's a lot of high, high, big Hollywood stars, a lot of big London stars who are in their trailer, won't come out, uh, will film tomorrow, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, Not with Tom. He's there before you. It's yeah. frankly terrifying that the, the star is there before other people. It scares the hell out of second ADs and first ADs. They, like, this is not what we're used to. We yeah. get it ready. Then the star cut. Then we bring them on. He's like, no, Tom's the producer as well. He's there. He's he's making stuff. There's, there's a really, like, to show how much he wants things to be better. There's this scene, I don't know if you remember it, where we're all doing push-ups. Yes. And it's yeah, first, yeah. his first few attempts to escape. Now, there were yes. a million different ways that scene was written. There was a whole... That was earlier was, in the movie, right? That was earlier in the quite movie. Quite early, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and obviously, yeah, it comes yeah. back again later because of the way the movie works. Correct, correct. But there were, there, were, there were loads of different ways that scene was written. There was this whole scene where he wandered off with me, my character, at one point that was going to be in the thing, and... There were all different ways of doing it. But as it stood, the day we were filming, we're doing push-ups. He rolls, tries to roll under a, a passing SUV. Uh, it's like a, or it's a tank. I can't remember. It might even be a tank. Yes. And he yes. gets squashed. And he tries that over and over again. That's what's filmed. Originally, that wasn't what happened. Originally, in the script, it was him running off, hiding behind a tank, trying to escape. Um, he came up with that on the day we were about to film this bit. We were all hundreds of soldiers, <laughs> hundreds of extras, all ready to do this. He was going to sneak off and get caught and come back again. He said, "No, no, no, no. I can die. I can come back to life. Let's do it this way. I'm going to do this. I do do two push-ups. I roll. Forget all of this dialogue. I get squashed by that truck. Then we do it again and do it again. And then the director Doug was like, who's very up for you know." working with people and coming up with stuff he thought for a minute doug and went okay everyone go home <laughs> everyone go back to your trailers that's what we're going to do we need to bring tanks in here we need to bring this that he wrote rewrote the scene on the set and it is it made that scene a thousand times better than what it was that's so the sort of yep and that's why i think people forget he was a studio head you know I'm, that, this has now become the the praise tom cruise podcast but <laughs> it's all i can think <laughs> when i think about Think about Edge of Tomorrow. Just think about what a powerhouse he is, and how extraordinary it was to that energy he's got. Yeah, he knows no, what he's you're, doing. You're right, and, and he's, he's he's and I tell people this all the time. He's truly one of the last movie stars in a sense that mm-hmm. he takes pride and loves it. I mean, I remember when the pandemic was at its worst, and he's still trying to. I think they were one of the first movies. To, I think it was um, Mission Impossible. They were just getting it back mm-hmm. on track. I think. And somebody was on set without a mask, and he went off. He's like, "I'm trying yeah. to pay everyone's salary here. I'm try- like he, but he wasn't doing it to be a dick. He was doing it because he just wanted to make this movie. Like that's what. Yeah, he's always I'll breaking say, ankles, and you know, he's just- yeah. I mean, if they if someone had caught it, if someone had tested positive, the, you know, at that point, the way things were going, that would have been shut down. The movie would have been shut down. Absolutely, for yes. at least a week, if not longer. The insurance would have kicked in. It would have been. You know those protocols they set up on that that shoot. Uh, what we all use now, pretty much. You know, um, the the mask policy. The the everyone has their own um, transport. The cohort system. 
Um, it's what we do now. It's exactly the same that you bring your own cutlery. You, you know, that's it's relaxing a bit now, obviously. But that film, that movie, and a couple of others were the ones that set up how we could keep filming. You know, it's it was there. That yeah, we did it. Uh, last question before we get into afterlife quickly. Um, I wanted to ask you: Does it ever, Tony, for you get? Is it hard to adjust? So, like, what, like when you're doing a movie like Edge of Tomorrow, or you're doing Game of Thrones, or you're doing, um, you know, the multitude of projects we're talking about, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo. Does it? Is it hard? Or maybe you're doing a day shoot for something smaller. Is it? Is it tough to adjust to that? The the magnitude of the project you're on. Does that take practice as an actor, or is it? You know what? I'm an actor. Bring it as I'll, I'll take it as it comes. Yeah, a, a little bit like that now. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, it's I treat them all. Do I treat them all with equal importance? I like to think I do. I'd like to show them all the same respect. Probably the nerves might be a little bit. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Meeting Tom Cruise for the first time, say, or meeting a huge director for the first time. Maybe I'll. Uh, there, I suppose it, the difference is in maybe the casting process for it as well, because if it's a day shoot thing or something small these days, I may have been, I may, may well have been asked to do it. That right. gives you a lot of confidence. You know, someone's saying, would you please Tony come and do this thing? And I'm like, Oh, okay. Maybe I will. Yeah. I'll do it for you. As a If it's something like a cruise movie or drag, you're casting, you're like everyone else. They're seeing everyone. Maybe you should, fight for it a bit more and when you get there you know it a bit more and because of that you're you're you're, you're on your a game quicker right but i like to think i treat them all the same I, I i don't think i treat any any of them sort of like as slumming it really um i don't tend to do like ads and stuff i think maybe i'd find it hard to get the <laughs> right the kind right. of same excitement of, you know Although, you know, if anyone out there wants me to shield for them, <laughs> you're open. Uh, we've all You're got a price. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, but on set, you know, it's at the end of the day, you are in a box. Sometimes it's a slightly bigger box or smaller box. Right. Looking at your iPhone, reading a paper, looking at the script most of the time. So actually, when you're doing smaller jobs, there's less of that. You're on set acting more. And that's always good. You know, that's yeah. great. Yeah, um, yeah, I just yeah, I, I love doing guest parts. That's my that's how I started, and that's something I'll always do. I love going and doing an episode, and those parts for me have got better. That's the great thing about becoming more known and getting on, and becoming just older looking, is that you get <laughs> good character parts and good sort of guests. I did one for Romish Ranganathan's got a new sitcom, Kel Supri. You know, he's like he's not on TV enough. He's right. on the television a lot here. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but that was great. I got to go and play this sort of character three days in and out. It was a really good fun and it's good people. And then you can just sort of leave like a sort of traveler. I love that. Very reminiscent of what you did as a kid, right? Just going in and having fun, right? Just doing exactly. your thing. Yeah, I get it. Exactly. I get it. Yeah, I wanted to just, th first of all, I want to thank you for Afterlife because I feel like I, I want to give a hug to every goddamn person on this, on this, in this cast for what you've done for so many people and what you've done for me. Like, Tony, without sounding like a ridiculous super fan, like thank you for that. Oh wow, well, that's extraordinary. I mean, it is a it's a hell of a reaction the show's got. It really is, and completely, completely unexpected oh, from season one. You know, we did. I had no idea how to to heart people were going to take it. Um, I had no idea how sad some of it was as well. I must be honest. You know, yeah, it's it's um. It's got it's it's done some amazing things for people. People really, genuinely have said it's helped them. People that have had um, bereavements and have had sort of lots of the things happen to them that are talked about in the show. That what that was what I wasn't expecting. I remembered all of the funny bits, you know, the the crazy bits. I forgot that Ricky was off filming tons of footage of his dead wife and you know yeah. and the the chats with Penelope that. Um, Obviously, I knew some of the things that Lenny was more involved in. The people that stopped me in the street are just, it's every type of person. It's people that have never stopped me in the street before. It's people that have never been in, you know, it's the first person that really stopped me that I was on holiday uh, <clears throat> in Norfolk, which is sort of in the countryside. It's a lovely part of the world, part of, a part of England. Yeah. And a, quite a, an older end of middle aged lady came up to me and said, I really didn't think I'd like that show and I loved it. And I cried my eyes out and my husband died a couple of years ago 
And I thought it would be a struggle, but it genuinely really helped me because I laughed and I cried all the way through it. And it was cathartic. Like it, it, it was it, for her. And I just couldn't, I was sort of stood there in the middle of a street, you know, I was off to buy some sort of like holiday knickknacks or something. And right. suddenly this person just unloaded onto me and it was like, this is genuinely touched people. This is, I told Ricky that and he said, I'm getting thousands of people on Twitter saying, really similar things this is he couldn't believe it he was as taken aback as i was yeah, yeah. and I, i've never seen anything like it how would you describe lenny for maybe those people that are curious to get your input or pe- maybe anybody who hasn't the, the the four people who haven't watched it yet you know it's got over a hundred million views and all very deserving and i'm so happy like you said you're <laughs> affecting so many lives how would you describe lenny tony he's uh he's probably he's like every man he's a, he's an every man character he's a, he's a friend He's a crutch to to Ricky's character, Tony. He's a punch bag, I think, as well, but a willing one. You know, he's up he's up for fun, and, and he doesn't mind the jokes. It's or it's it's water off a duck's back. But he's, I think, that's what he is. He's a. I was thinking about this the other day. We were talking to someone about this, and the thing that people forget he's a photographer as well. So, right, his big thing is sitting back and watching people so he can in all of those scenes where where ricky is um sort of talking to these people and getting this ridiculous stories from them all the really sad stories for them lenny doesn't say much he sort of sits back and listens um but it means he gets to look he gets to sit back and watch tony as well and just make sure his friend's okay that's what he's there for that's what he sees his main job is. He's, he's he's probably not a very good photographer. It's the truth. I don't think. <laughs> I think he's a sort of bang average photographer. Yeah. But his job is making sure that the character Tony is okay. I think he processes. Um, he's he stays back and he processes what, what's yeah. going on. Yeah. yeah it's quite yeah. a simple worldview. It's quite. It's just sort of this is this. His big thing is that there's you know you just, if you're going on a date it's a ball gown or a blazer and slacks. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it's fish and chips. It's it's simple. A beer, a beer, and the football. Yeah, he's a simple yeah. guy. But yes. that makes him so happy that I think that makes Tony's character happy as well. But also a bit annoyed with it. Yes, <laughs> that he can just drift through life happy. But very relatable to it. But very, but very, yeah. but, but but I see parts of myself in Lenny. I mean, I think millions of people see them. But that's what that's. I think that's. I mean, I, I'm I'm not that far removed. I got. It's like we're talking about him like as a character. Ricky <laughs> Ricky casts very close to the yes. character he wants. <laughs> yes. Yes. You know when he um when he he can't he he cast me and um he said coming because this was like a year before we started doing anything proper on the show. He said, would you come in and we'll chat about the character and stuff? He was very collaborative on this show. We all knocked ideas about. This was like a year before. I'd never been to his office before. I'd met him in town and, you know, various things before but and on set, but never to his office in Hampstead. Yeah. And it was, it's like down the side of a shop, up some stairs, more stairs, more stairs. His assistant's taking me up there. I was like, oh, I got to like the fifth flight of stairs and i was like oh god I'm, i was getting up like, <laughs> bearing in mind like the job of my dreams at the top of these stairs finally yeah. we got into his office and i was like oh thank god for that it's the end of the end of the stairs and i looked and there was a mezzanine with another flight of stairs ricky wasn't at his desk he was up there oh my god oh for fuck's sakes more stairs <laughs> i didn't realize he was up there and i just said ah, 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 laughing at perfect let's go from the script that's uh, we've got we've cast lenny it's done yeah so, I think there's a lot of Lenny and Len, me and Lenny too. It's what I'm getting at with that one. You know, and, and it's funny because the only time Lenny really ever asks him for anything is to be his best man. And he, mm-hmm. after he throws the cheap shot, he's like, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's just so sweet. Very sweet. It, it's And it's also like, I don't know if Lenny think knows it. We, he will say yes as well in that moment. It's, it takes a lot for Lenny to ask anything. A lot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's, you know, not, and, he's not that guy. He He's, he's, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so Ricky, Ricky clearly like clearly likes you a lot, right? We talk about Derek <laughs> Afterlife Extras. Life's too short. Do you think? And, and I don't want to get too personal here, but is your rapport with him just professional? Do you view him as like a colleague and a friend? Um, Definitely, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, I, I wouldn't say we would like friends before uh, Afterlife. We we knew each other, and he had been very kind to cast me in loads of his stuff, you know, over the years. Um, it's a small world, the comedy world in the UK, by the way. It's mostly, it's quite London centric. 
Right. Um, especially TV comedy world. So you you do know people. You bump into each other. And, you know, like I say, I, work, I worked on 11 o'clock show. Not only was Sasha on that, Ricky was on that in later series. Uh, so you bump into people. And I'd been a comedy writer as well as a performer. So, um, but now definitely, because we work together so much, you know, he, he he's always texting funny things and emails and stuff. but ricky doesn't go out and neither do i so it's not like everyone's hitting the town but yeah, he, he, yeah he throws little parties now and again and yeah it's i'd say a friendly and work acquaintances all, all yeah. rolled into one yeah and and, and, and you in and, and season three one of my favorite parts is just the journey when they you know they're interviewing people going to take these wacky stories these pictures just i i love tony and lenny's rapport just their the way they go about things, the way they they approach life, just their conversations, the little things that it's just it's one of the more meaningful parts of afterlife for me. It's that thing of um, they've known each other a long time, and they're, they're, the the sort of unwritten things there, there's sort of unsaid things, things they don't need to say because they kind of both they both know when someone said something funny or ridiculous. That's one of my favorite things that we do in those interviews is the little side look to each other. Right. Um, the little knowing like and they both and we even when we're acting it we don't plan that we kind of know that as well like yeah, Ricky yeah. and I that that's yeah. a moment where we'll go like we both find that funny or we'd both find that odd or uncomfortable <laughs> um, it's kind of like I've got friends like that that I've known forever and you can say whatever you like to each other and about each other and no one's ever offended and I was yeah. going to say within reason but I don't think even that I think even yeah. without, without reason yeah, you know yeah. that if it's that outrageous, it was definitely a joke. Yeah, <clears throat> and mostly it's all taken in good fun, and it's not not bullying. I'm not talking about bullying humor, but you can kind of they're this they're sort of a, they're, they're, they've got that friendship. I think where they've they've knocked around for long enough. They've got a lot of shared history. There'll be loads of you know things that they've been through together and seen together that um that makes it easy. You know, they just knock about together lenny doesn't speak much and i don't think he needs to no but when, no. you know if you ask him a question he'll give you an answer if it's even if it's, if it's ridiculous or not yeah um, yeah 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 <laughs> yeah you know you know and i and i have a few final questions for you thank you for all this time tony you're such a oh, good guy no worries yeah so you know um i, I was thinking about this right because i brought this up to ethan i was watching the outtakes right of season two <laughs> and season that i was new to that because i'm just processing the show never mind the outtakes <laughs> And I couldn't stop. I have to tell you, I'm not sure how anyone has a straight face around uh, Paul, David, or Colin at any time. I mean, I was talking to Ethan about the scene at the, you know, the, the drama. Like how how oh. how anyone how that how that gets done in anything less than a hundred takes? I I don't get it because these guys are flat out insane. They're characters, flat out insane. But and it's a, you know, it was a day right um, in the office. It was in the office. So the office scenes. are you know, some of them are quite sad, and especially in this this season, you know, yes. there's not tons in the office in this season. There's bits, but there's not as. But there was a day, one day, in a row, we had, um, who came in first? Gittings. So David came in first. Yeah. Did a joke. Did all of that. Impossible. Like hysterical laughter in tears. Colin came in. Did a whole thing about renting his house out. Like there's some. He said. <laughs> Half of the stuff again didn't make it. The ad libs there. <laughs> I, now I was in pain. Then Ratty and the Nonce came in and did their huge podcast spiel. And it, <laughs> genuinely, it was like we'd been raided by comedy Vikings. It was, I felt like we'd been pillaged. It was extraordinary. Because <laughs> we just had to, they were supposed to sit there and say straight face. We're supposed to be shocked and a bit cross with them. It, it's impossible. It was painful. It's it you get yourself into this the worst ones for me. Those ones I can I can handle in the end because you just have to treat it as if you're watching a comedy performance and I didn't have loads to do. People have got lines with them, good luck. That's your problem. I'm just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's when you're up close to someone like a character like Brian Gittings and you're here and you're in a dirty house and he's doing <laughs> you never know what he's gonna do next. It yeah. changes every time. And it's not even like he changed the lines every time. It'll be a little look, or his eyes will dart, or oh, it's tough. I mean, yeah. Ricky and I are useless. Like, we're a port. We're the worst. Like if we we just don't. We don't. I don't think we even film one scene straight. It's madness. 
<laughs> you'd never get away with it anywhere else. It's only because he's the boss that we can do it. You know, it, 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 it got me thinking, uh, Tony, is there ever a scene where, you know, the, the outtakes, for those who haven't seen, you have to watch them two in season two and three, but like, is there ever a moment where it's the opposite emotion, where the scene has such gravity to it that somebody gets really so emotional they have to almost do another take? I mean, I guess that would be part of the I mean, scene maybe they can, you know what I'm saying? Like an outtake in an emotional way. Yeah, yeah. No, I know what you mean. I think, um, I think actually not so much. I think that Ricky has this thing where he says, because he can cry, Ricky. Like it's it's mind blowing. I'm not that great at that. I, I yeah. can do it, but I'm ne- I, I, thankfully I'm never asked to really do it. It's not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Right. Ricky right. can cry. He's there. He's done. It happens. But he can only do it once. Yeah. Because he says when he cries, he cries for real. And then once he's done that, he feels better. So he can't do it again, which is extraordinary. <laughs> That's real. That's those, those t- Ricky's, they're real Ricky tears. They're extraordinary. He's amazing at that. Joe, who plays uh, my fiance, on the other hand, cries all the time at everything. She's extraordinary. She literally will be in a scene, in a funny scene, wander out. We'll carry on the scene and it will get a bit sad. You'll wander off for lunch after the scenes that you'll cut and she'll be in the corner just streaming with wow yeah that really gets to she lives every bit of that the one that nearly got me was uh i think it's in season one we go to see a woman who gets impaled by a skewer and yeah the the joke is she says her fat saved her yeah and ricky's joke is well if you weren't fat you wouldn't have been skewered you know it's like <laughs> so we go from that scene ridiculous yeah. we walk out of the door look in another door and he says that's where lisa died and the scene just goes boom it just like the air gets taken out of the scene and yeah uh, and ricky gives him a little hug it's the only time really that's ever ha- ever happens with us where it it goes we go beyond just jokes quite a lot, but where actually physically I hug him, that nearly got me. I was sort of a bit choked up for that one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, use that. that. That's good. Get that on camera. Right, right, right. Laughter, right. on the other hand, not so good. <laughs> you, you know, um, one of the great reflections comes from Ricky, you know, because Ricky and Tony are similar, certainly when it comes to religion and being an atheist. That's not, you know, Ricky's made that very public. But you know, the, the one of the more more powerful scenes is when he talks when he's wondering to himself if he robbed her of, you know, having hope going on into the afterlife, going having mm. having you know, it's such a wonderful reflection, you know, because I think I struggle with that part of life too, the religious part, and to hear mm. Ricky kind of knowing what Ricky is like to have him do that, to have him, I don't know, I just found that beautiful. I found it really beautiful. Yeah, it's and he he definitely came back. Um, in the last series with the, the, when we go to the kids chemotherapy ward and the, mm. the, the kid asks like, you know, do you believe in heaven? And then he looks at him like, what the hell are you going to say? Mm. And he says, yeah, yeah, of course I do. Because it doesn't do why, why, you know, he's not a monster. Um, mm. It definitely makes her feel better. So, right. you know, it's, it's an imp- very, very important question. It's a big question to ask in a sitcom you know huge but ricky loves to ask those questions it's it's sort of part of um it's part of he's the way he thinks you know i don't i've never thought i've never thought that you know i yeah. never thought that did i rob her of that or did i make him more scared because i didn't believe in heaven i've never genuinely never like it probably shows how shallow i am really but no. that's not a question i'd ever ask myself yeah until i, I thought yeah, that's an amazing question to ask. It's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's you know, and knowing I was going to speak with you today, I was, I was eating lunch. At, you know, at my other job, and um, I had a few moments. So I, I was watching the last half of of season um, uh, three, episode six, and mm. I got to tell you what a mistake that was because I was crying at. I mean, I was like, I mean, my I I told uh, Ethan this yesterday. My head was between my. I mean, I have never been so emotionally. I mean. Like maybe Shawshank, but like right, this yeah, is yeah. this. You know, you have Joni Mitchell playing both sides. You have uh, Ricky and you know, uh, looking at you know Tony's looking at everybody and to see everyone's having their little moment of happiness, right? Because everyone was struggling with something in that in this show, and you know, Lenny asks him to turn around for one last picture, and my God! And then when Ricky walks away and you see 
poor auntie fade away and then Lisa joins him and then fades away and then it's it's Tony by himself and you, and you still hear this wonderful song playing. What a beautiful moment Lenny has where he takes that picture. And, mm. and by then, I mean, I, I'm like I said, I'm by then it's just, I, I think it's the greatest, I want to say six to seven minutes of television history that I've ever seen. I mean, I, it's, there's, so, yeah. there's so much power in that. I, I can't even, I wish I had the verbiage to articulate how, how powerful I mean, it was. Because Ricky had, um, he had all of lockdown, you know, that extra long time to write. He had to rush see, not rush season two, but he, it was a short amount of time. Because he had longer for season three, that he was cooking that stuff up for a very long time, much longer than he normally takes to write stuff. That the whole thing at the fair, um, he really thought about that. That was everyone got their exit, everyone got a really good everyone everyone's exit is a is a beginning to another thing as well that's the other thing people each character has got something to go on to yeah Rick, ricky's character hasn't it's quite important that i think that he wanted everyone to have then he's going off to get married cat's happy now she's got herself a dog you know ethan's friends with so and so everyone's pairing off he hasn't got that um and then i saw everyone had these scenes and, and lenny didn't um have one yet and i never do this I, i'm so happy to just step back and be in the background whatever but i did say to ricky this was we were filming i think at this point um what's the deal with lenny at the end like is he gonna be there like what's and he said no i've got i've got an idea lenny needs to be just drifting around i don't want him to be anywhere specific i've got a thought about that um and then i think it was two days before we shot that final scene, he sent me, he emailed me just the page of hit what happens with him walking off. So I don't know how long he had that written. Right. Or if he was holding it back, but he sent me that scene. I genuinely got goosebumps. I was like, this, is, this ending is going to absolutely kill people. People are going to be in bits when they see this ending. And I was really pleased that I was part of that ending as well. I must admit, I was like, this is, this is a great ending, man. This is, it's you know, a very it's a very Lenny and Tony ending as well. Uh, it's a there's not a lot of dialogue there. It's a couple of looks and a and then there are there are some wild theories about what goes is going on at the end there. Yeah, Ricky's explanation is life goes on. Everyone yeah. dies. Like he dies. Tony dies. The dog dies. Everyone dies in the end. Yeah. Just not today. Yeah, that's his. To tell that to some guys on Twitter. They're not having it. They, 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 there's lots of other things going on. <laughs> the wildest one is that I, that Lenny, what he sees on the camera when he looks down is the ghost of Lisa appearing next to him. And I'm like, yeah, that's that not this show. <laughs> that I, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I'm not buying it, but it's interesting to think about that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it's, 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 it's how much you want to delve into it too, because like when you just see the, you know that's life right we try to move on best as we can as, as hurt as we are we lose our loved ones whether it's a mm. it's a beautiful dog we love or a, a lifetime companion whom we love and it's about trying to make that journey no matter how much pain you're in and afterlife just just puts its hands around your heart and it's just it, it, it doesn't let go and that's just so mm. so beautiful so beautiful um one last thing i'm not sure that um that ethan's character is better off with brian than he was at home i mean anytime you're taking a bath and you have somebody um, on the toilet. I have to say that's probably not an improvement. He disagrees with me, but I, I'm staying <laughs> home all day on that one, Tony. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. agree. I mean, Lenny is quite happy that he's moved out. Um, I would say at least at home, the that bath is clean. You know, <laughs> God oh yes, knows. God knows what's happened in that bath. Yeah, like those sets like it doesn't matter that it's not real it feels real <laughs> as well. yes what was ethan's thought then ethan thought that he's getting out at least he's getting out in the world and right he's a young guy making his yeah. first but it's like brian is non-stop about this yeah. and this adventure he's had and this exp you know, it's just crazy it's just i yeah. don't know but um, and brian is not going places <laughs> no <laughs> no he's not and, he, and he's really enthusiastic about telling you about his past uh exploits so he's really so yeah um yep tony thank you for all this time um what lies ahead anything you want to throw out there um um no i'm just looking after a toddler at the moment i'm doing childcare, so that's my uh time at the moment but there's a few things i filmed i just filmed a little 
bit in a sitcom here and I maybe got a thing that I can't really talk about coming up, I'm afraid. So, but um, yeah, if you want to find out what I'm doing, you can get me on Twitter. That's the place to go because I don't talk anywhere else apart from podcasts so Absolutely. look out for my twitter and, and i'll tell you on there <laughs> yeah and, and i sincerely mean this tony thank you for what you've done for just not only me but for just millions of others who have who this show is just you know it's one thing to do work as an actor but it's another thing to do very meaningful life-changing work and i think that's what you've done here oh thank you that's very kind of you to say i mean yeah i'm british so i'm never going to take that uh, <laughs> that kind of praise yeah well, <laughs> well I, I mean no, thank and, and, you. Yeah, you deserve it. Uh, Tony, enjoy enjoy your day and um, safe and healthiness, happiness, healthiness to you and your family. So thank you for that. You too, Derek. It's been a pleasure. I've really enjoyed it.